but, um, but uh, with Barry Noble and I, with Albert Schell, we put together a bunch of uh, questions, which I will fire at them both, and I'm not sure who's going to answer the questions, but um, I'm sure and there will be interesting answers. I'll just give a preamble first. Oh, please. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'll, I won't ad lib this because my wife is here, so I have to be very careful what I say. So. Um, Shields started uh, with one store in the market in 1977. Prior to that date, my wife and I had lived and worked in Canada for seven years. I was involved in the marketing of pharmaceuticals for a major company and my wife was working for a large chemical conglomerate. I grew up in Sydney and ever since the age of about 12, I was involved in making jewellery for friends and selling some jewellery to small stores. It was really a hobby and I wasn't particularly good at it, but the jewellery sold nevertheless. Um, anyway, what could be better than to join, uh, combine my formal marketing training with my hobby, which is what I decided to do when I purchased the original Shields store from the widow of Jack Shields, who had passed away a few months earlier, leaving the business in very poor shape and leaving his wife with no money and no income. I took over the business and I employed his wife for some years until she decided to retire. Three years into the business, I decided the company should become a chain store operation as I could see the future was to establish oneself in the new shopping centres which were cropping up everywhere. My first store was in Marion, followed by Tea Tree Plaza, Elizabeth, and wherever Westfield went, we opened a store we followed. I soon learned that running a multiple organisation, organ multiple store organisation was completely different to operating at one, one store. I had to develop a completely different set of skills, and fortunately for me, I was able to do that. Over the next 20 years, we established our company throughout South Australia, but I chose not to open stores interstate until my children had finished high school. My rules were to be at home for dinner every night and to return to work when my children were asleep, if I had to go back to work. <clears throat> Once we had a very tricky legal issue when Toby had just entered the business, and he handled, that, handled it extremely well, according to the lawyer who was involved in giving us the advice. The lawyer was very impressed with Toby's knowledge of the law and business in particular, and he said to Toby, where had you acquired such in-depth knowledge at such an early age? And Toby answered, at the breakfast and dinner. <laughs> Which is true. Listening to mum and dad, listening to mum and dad. That is where Toby's business education started. Of course, he went on to university and formal training, but in my opinion, his training really came at the dinner table. Toby has worked in all parts of the business, starting as a store member, salesperson, moving on to manager, then buyer, finally managing director. Uh, to some of you, that might sound like a dream run. Well, Toby can tell you that taking, a business, taking over a business from a parent and founder is not easy. Um, before I hand over to Barry, I'd like, I'd like to ask some questions. I'd like I'd like to ask us some questions about describe simple incident. I'd like to describe a simple incident, sorry. What occurred about two years ago between Toby and I. We were having a discussion about a huge increase in the petty cash costs for the preceding month. When I looked into it, I found that Toby had purchased an espresso machine which had the little pods, and the cost of coffee in our company had dramatically increased. And the reason was that the staff preferred the coffee from these pods, and instead of going out to Chibo, they were staying in work and drinking our coffee. And Toby told me, well, even though we've had an increase in cost, it's great for, mor it's great for morale, everyone's staying here, we're getting better productivity. I'm not sure that I completely agreed with him because the costs were ex exceedingly high, in my opinion. But anyway, uh, being a jeweler, I decided to take one, home, one of these pods home and measure the amount of coffee and I weighed it. And I came back and I said to him, do you realise it's seven cents worth of coffee in this and we're paying 80 cents? Well, that conversation ended up in us Toby then decided to go into the coffee business and instead of spending 80 cents per pod, we spent a million dollars on a machine to make the coffee. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say actually was the, the whole enterprise was facilitated and would have been impossible to actually achieve the, uh, the success that it has, and I think Toby will agree, if I hadn't met Pat Christie. There he is. Oh, is he? No, you're not. Um, yeah, Pat Christie, I met him at the Trailblazer one. We were there for hours on end, you know, nothing to do but talk to each other, and I found out that he had a, a lot of knowledge on how to put powder into packets and that sort of thing, and I said, and he had a son-in-law who was uh, 
keen to get back into work because they just sold their business and he became an equity partner and without him, I don't think, Toby, that business would have succeeded. Do you agree? Yeah. Um, so that's, there's a good reason to join Rotary, right? Um, now I'd like to hand over... I'll hand over to you now, Barry. Thanks, Alan. Well, you, 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 you've answered two or three of my questions. Also, you've answered two or three of my questions. Stand but you, but you, you, you now have You now have 47 stores, I gather. Yes, that's right. And, uh, and how do you cover that breadth of business, you know, in the time that you have available? Uh, it, it's not difficult because I've got a son. <laughs> well, it is difficult because I have a father. And if you think that it's easy working with your father, I mean, it, sometimes it's a breeze, but it's not... I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are married. It would be like working with your spouse. I mean, some, you still love them, correct? But it sometimes presents as difficulties. <laughs> It, it is, uh, yeah, to answer it simply, it's not, it's not easy and really the growth came when Toby was fully committed to the business, that's when we went in, a, a great growth spurt, went from 20 odd stores to 48, 47. All right, now, now Toby, uh, one, of your, one of your strengths at the moment is, is the coffee business. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, as uh, Dad elaborated on, uh, it wouldn't have been possible without a connection through Rotary. I think it, it can't be underestimated that that was really the difference between success or failure for us because my, you know, we had the idea, everyone has an idea, there are millions of ideas. The only way you can get a, an idea to fly is if you're uh, able to connect with the right people and we had no connections in fast moving consumer goods. We're from a retail environment which is very different, a very much more lumbering beast. Um, whereas FMCG, fast moving so supermarkets work extremely fast by comparison. And so the, the idea of being able to, to build a machine here to manufacture coffee was outside of our capacity of knowledge. So uh, the connection that Albert had with Pat Christie led to David Keelan, who we alluded to earlier, ended up being, he's our chief engineer. And um, without him, it have, wouldn't have been possible to put it together. And his expertise in shelf-ready packaging and a number of, even just the language that people speak in FMCG is different to the way that we speak in retail. They have their, you can actually have a conversation, no one can understand you, it's like Swahili. And so now we all speak Swahili, because um, David wrote us a little uh, dictionary on how to understand what Coles buyers are talking about. Um, and the business has been very successful because of those connections, because of those people. Now, for, for both of you, what, what, what do you feel is the major difference between um, people who, who really are entrepreneurs like yourself and people who work for other companies? I think there's really only basically one difference, and that's the, uh, the desire or ability or the lack of uh, fear and take a risk. I mean, uh, this business hasn't always made money. It's actually gone through some very difficult periods and periods where it's lost money. So um, I think it's the the risk aspect is probably the most important. But I must say before, I, I, another Rotary connection is Mr. Peter Neal, if he would like to stand up there, Mr. Neal. Um, he did some research for us many, many years ago and the uh, advertising company said, I thought that I was the most important part of the company and the research showed that I wasn't important, it was actually Shields was the brand. And from that research, I decided that Toby can take over, no problem. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, how do you go about marketing your business? Um, and um, uh, what's been your most successful form of it? Yeah, um, that's changed a lot in the last few years because of the way that the market has developed. I mean, now everyone is um, talking about the millennial customer. The millennial customer is very different. I'm judging by the average age of people here that you're all between the age of 35 and 40. So the millennial ends at 37. So they're people for whom um, September 11 shaped their existence, right? They're, these are the people that you see walking into polls because they're on their phone. They're people like me. Um, so they're the biggest pool of, um, of money. They're the biggest customers. And, and different to what's happened historically with generational purchases is that now you're looking at, at, at the millennial customer. If you market to them, you're not losing out on the older market. So the millennial mother, uh, so the millennial daughter is shopping with their mother and influencing those decisions. So you really, that's, that's where the focus of all of our marketing is now centered. So here's a little, here's a little proof of that. 
Um, I imagine that most people here would like would prefer to get a phone call if someone's trying to sell to them. Well, a millennial customer will not answer your phone call. Um, we don't like receiving phone calls. We hate phone calls. Call us and we will not answer you. <laughs> but if you text us, we'll text you back and we'll happily have a conversation over that um, media. And that's a huge difference. So we actually divide our marketing strategy up depending on what age group our customers are. And understanding your customer to that level of granularity is the difference between success or failure in an age where you can choose to communicate through any different, uh, through multiple medias. Uh, and that's really, really key to, to understanding your customer. What kind of culture, um, both of you, um, exists in your organisation? Would you say it's a democratic, um, participative? Are any of your employees shareholders in your company? No, the, the uh, employees are not shareholders, but they're stakeholders because uh, we, we are democratic in terms of the decision making is not only from the top, we, we are very consultative, um, but it, it's had to change over the years where when the company was very small, it was just two or three people making a decision, that was easy, but as it gets bigger, there's so many more people involved in the decision making that really I'll probably hand over to Toby to answer that okay. more, more fully. Um, yeah, well, we've got some extremely strong personalities who don't take crap from either of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we have one in particular, a new person we have brought on board recently called Maria, who, like, God, God help you if you try to uh, road, steamroll her. Um, but yeah, the organisation is one, is a culture of acceptance, a culture where we truly value the input of people who are better at their jobs than we can ever be. In terms of marketing, our marketing manager is smarter than both of us put together in that field. So we surround ourselves with people who are truly giants in those fields and we would do well to listen to them and, and, we, and we often do. It's very rare that we will override um, their decisions. So it's about surrounding, I feel that you, the only way you can truly build a company of this size is to surround yourself with people for whom you have utter respect for their decision making and just let them go and do their thing and just, just manage them. That's and a third, a third of our, sorry, a third of our office uh, um, workers have been with us for 38 years from day one. I've still got the original person who started with the business. So, and they've come, and some people have left, you know, had a fight, argued, left, never come back. So, I think we're reasonable employers. You know, Rotarians, this is called a vocational talk, according to David, and and uh, out of these talks, we learn a lot about the people. But we also learn about how they run their businesses, and that, that's something we can take away. Um, Adelaide is, is notoriously a different place for marketing than some of the other capital cities. Now, you've got stores in, um, in three or four capital cities. Yes. Tell us uh, about the difference in marketing here. Well, the Adelaide people are actually quite conservative and it's, a, it, it's usually used as a test market for supermarkets and all sorts of people like to test things out in Tasmania and, and Adelaide. Uh, some of the other states are a little bit more, uh, they'll try things more quickly like Queensland. So we had to alter our marketing. Uh, we have, an, all national companies have a national marketing um, scope, but we find that there's a very English uh, influence in Western Australia and the, if we send goods that are more more related to the English style we'll sell them better than we'll sell in Adelaide or in Queensland and in Queensland we'll sell so there is this there's difference but it's very difficult as a national company to actually alter what you're offering uh, the you know one catalog goes out we do a million and we send it to everyone but we try to put a bit of everything into it um, and some marketing is accepted in Adelaide where I used to do the hoo-ha and I was a funny guy and it all worked well. And when I tried that in Western Australia, it didn't take quite as well. They didn't take to me quite as well. well where's the no hoo-ha business in Adelaide gone? There's hoo-ha there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that style of marketing really worked to be uh, disruptive and there's no doubt that without that marketing campaign, it was, it was during a really tough period of our business that that was activated. Without that, we would have failed. It, the business would have been in real trouble. So there's a time and a place. And then if you really want to mature as an organisation and start selling diamonds to people who really care about trust and all that sort of stuff, your marketing has to reflect what you truly are trying to communicate to your customer. Um, and so that campaign wasn't, it was never going to be a, a super long-term campaign. There was going to be an end date to that. 
and, and now we've, we've matured in terms of how we communicate to our customers. It all, all circles back to understanding what your customer wants because what we want is completely irrelevant. It's about what they want um, and that's the only thing that you, we, th we think. We all have a plaque on our desks at work that says think like a customer. So whenever there's an idea that sounds a little bit, there's a, there's a fork in the road and you have to choose one way or the other, bring it back and think about what your customer wants because nothing else matters. You both mentioned uh, diamonds today, but, but if, I think I'd be talking for everybody if I'd said that not many of us know much about the diamond, the, the, the global diamond supply chain, De Beers and Kimberley and Belgium and all that sort of stuff. Would you like to say a few words about yeah, that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off and I'll hand over to Toby, but um, the diamond business is actually quite controlled worldwide. Um, Australia produces more diamonds than anywhere else, but they're not of gem quality. They're, they're lower than gem, but they actually produce, in terms of carrots, the highest quantity. Um, South, obviously, uh, South Africa produces a lot of them. They've been they're renowned for it, um, and they're the main place. But all the most, up until very recently, every diamond, no matter where it was dug up from, went to London, and it got sold from London. It, uh, the De Beers headquarters and the whole industry was centred in London and from there it would be distributed to all the other countries and De Beers who used to have 80% of the market which now is probably 65% but still pretty high, um, they would offer their box of diamonds each month to a select group of people which they call site holders, that might be 30 people and they would be offered each box is $20 million roughly, 5 to $20 million. And if one of the site holders is having a bad run and his country's not doing too well or whatever and he refuses to buy the diamonds, he doesn't get invited next month. So it's, it's important to clear your diamonds and that's where Shields has been very successful is that I, I picked that cycle in the market and, uh, and we pick it all the time where some companies are, got overstocks, they've got to get rid of their diamonds because they're going in for the next buy and that's where we get we try and grab those diamonds very quickly and get bargains. We can't always do it, that's why we're not always the best price, but we do it more efficiently and probably better than, than most of our competitors and, and that's why we've grown the way we have. Yeah, um, there's also one other really interesting thing that happened in Canada. Canada's pretty analogous to Australia in terms of temperament and history. They, uh, the Canadian government or the Jewelers Association of Canada uh, implemented a program, I think it was 10 or 15 years ago, where they decided that, because Canada has quite a large diamond industry, very similar to the Australian diamond industry, where they would say they'd clip the ticket, 10% of all the diamonds mined, so they would, sorry, they would give um, the rights to mine Canadian diamonds to Rio Tinto or BHP, um, but the, on the proviso that 10% of those diamonds had to be cut in Canada. So they created this industry, and you might see the Canadian diamonds advertised around the place. So when in the Canadian psyche, when they close their eyes and imagine what their country stands for, diamonds is actually part of the, that thing. So when we close our eyes and think about what Australia stands for, it would be nice if diamonds actually form part of that. So if the, if the seas and winds are all right at one point, we would, I would love nothing more than to to pitch that idea to, to government. I think it would be fantastic. Rotarians, one of the reasons why we didn't know what the title was until last night was that, was that, uh, <laughs> was that, that Albert was scuba diving uh, in Guam and truck, um, trying to find uh, American destroyers and aircraft and some, you found some skulls of uh, servicemen, didn't you? Mm. Would you like to tell us about that hobby and where you've dived? I, I used to, as a young person, I used to dive all the time and then my eyesight went and I didn't like diving with glasses, so I gave it up for 20 years. And then I had laser surgery and took up diving again, which I thoroughly enjoy. And I've always been a scuba diver, I mean, I've enjoyed it. But the um, thing that, that stood out when I went to um, truck is the, uh, I, you dive on these boats and you go right down into the into the engine room and right in the depths of the and you can still see bodies in there when they're skulls now I can't imagine an Australian being left in the boat for 40 years but these poor Japanese people they got the 66 stuck in one submarine they're still there I think if it was Australia we'd go there cut them out and, and do something but anyway it was quite interesting to see this poor bugger with his you know skull up in there I've shown it to my wife and to friends um, and it's quite deep, but it's a, 
fascinating place. There were more bombs dropped in this lagoon truck, which is smaller than a very small area, than there was in Pearl Harbor. So it was actually a very interesting place to visit. But I don't recommend the hotel because <laughs> when I got to the hotel, I was a bit bored at three o'clock in the afternoon after my dive, and I decided to watch the TV. And I said, "There's no remote." I went downstairs. I said, "There's no remote," and she said. No, there isn't. I said, well, I can't turn the TV on. She said, well, there's no point. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, we don't have any TV here. <laughs> and I, I said, but you've got a flat screen TV. She said, yes, that's for the publicity. <laughs> <laughs> and Toby, what are your hobbies? Uh, I, I love mountain biking and running. Um, yeah, do that every, every, as much as possible. Um, I feel that uh, from a business point of view, it calms you because if you can push your body to... <laughs> breaking point every morning, then everything else is just a breeze, even dealing with this guy. <laughs> Actually, I should touch on that. It's not, it's not easy to hand over um, when you've been the sole proprietor of a business and you've built it up and you've done it with certain ideas and the way that you, you like things to do, and then a young millennium comes in and says, well, we've got to do this and we've got to do that. Handing over is actually, it, it's tough for Toby and it, it's tough for me, so it's not as easy as people would uh, have you think, handing over to a, to a sibling, a sibling is not, it's not an easy task, and I think Toby would probably agree with that. Rotarians, this has been an absolutely fascinating talk by these two, uh, and we thank you for it. Are there any questions from the floor? Right, uh, uh, Peter. <coughs> It's about cut. Um, the cut is the only thing that's influenced by a man when you dig it up. Everything else is already predetermined. And the a diamond that's uncut is, base, is, is just a rock. So the, the actual artisanry and the, the beauty that's unleashed, is, that's definitely where the, where the metal hits the road. It's, it's the cut that's the most important. Everything else, I think, is superfluous to that. It influences all the other things too. If it's cut well, it influences colour, clarity, uh, and, and carat weight. So everything else is influenced by cut. I'll just, add one, I'll just add one piece that 10 or 15 years ago, the, the diamond w prices were inflated and kept inflated by De Beers. But currently, it's a genuine supply and demand issue. There really is a shortage of diamonds, and the prices are kept up by genuine supply and demand, whereas that wasn't the case 15 or 20 years ago. Are they, are they being treated as somewhere to put money instead of gold? I can't say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Peter, right down the back. Yeah, in, in Europe they already have that. It's standardised to the Nespresso machine. So in, in Spain, the, um, the market penetration of Nespresso is 60%. And try to imagine 60% of households in Spain have a Nespresso machine. So that's the, in the, the market with the highest penetration. France with 50, and then all other countries in Europe sit around there. But in Australia, because it was late to, we were late to market, 2007, uh, we have two main competing systems, Café Italy and Nespresso, and they're both on... You know, Nespresso is still 85% of the dollar value, but the volume is about the same. So there's always going to be two systems, in my opinion, here. John, I can tell you want to ask a question. They're used in industry. So they're either used as paste to polish diamond, because you can only cut diamond with diamond. So the actual uh, paste that we use on, on little like CDs, discs, to actually cut, to facet a diamond, that's diamond paste. And there's varying uh, degrees of that. So if you need to cut the diamond faster, you use a higher uh, coarsity, and then it comes down. Um, otherwise, it's used in diamond tip drilling and various other... Uh, Oil and industry. gas. Yeah, that as well. Industry. It's used in industry mainly. Uh, all the, yeah, they're not chips, but they, the fine granules of diamonds. But I'll, I'll tell you something that's also interesting. 
if a diamond has a hardness of 10 and the sandpaper or the paper that you're using is a hardness of 10, how come it gets, how, how can you cut a diamond? It doesn't make sense, right? Well, the diamond's only hardness of 10 on one, one facet and it's hardness 9.8 on another. So you just keep moving the plate around. That's how they're cut. So that, that's a fact that you can take home with you because you can't cut a hard thing with a hard thing. You need something softer, right? Albert and Toby, your, 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 your talk, your answers to questions today have been intensely interesting and we greatly appreciate the time you've taken to put into preparing your replies, if you did. Gold pen? Eh? No, well, we had a couple, we had a couple of uh, gold watches and diamond encrusted, but we thought it was Coles to Newcastle. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.